Our sermon title this morning is That You May Believe, That You May Believe. And we're in John chapter 19, verses 31 through 42. As we come to our text this morning, we're reminded that in John chapter 19, verse 30, the Lord Jesus Christ has died, having accomplished all that he came to do, having accomplished all the Father's will, having done all those things which are pleasing to him, he now cries out with a loud voice from the cross, it is finished. And he yielded up his spirit to God and he breathes his last. Some now standing around the cross are here standing by, waiting to take him away because they loathed him. They want to see him removed from their sight and others are now here at the cross, standing by, waiting to take him away because they loved him. To the many there who hated him, who despised him, they might have felt vindicated by this scene, right? In their hard-hearted rebellion, in their wicked, rebellious sin, they went right back unmoved by this scene to their false worship, their empty ritualism. Many might have gone back to the Passover celebration that was taking place in the temple at the time, unmoved. Some may have been seemingly indifferent, but really how can you characterize their indifference considering what's happened here and the scene that's set before us from the pages of Scripture? He was just another criminal, and they went right back. To those that loved him who were standing by, this was tragic. This was tragic, almost inexplicable. Right? Doubts and confusion would have swirled around in their head. All their hopes would have evaporated, not understanding the implications of the death of Christ, not understanding what would happen next, certainly not understanding that he was about to be raised from the dead, not understanding what was going on on the cross in those dark three hours for them, their ex- expectations were crushed, their hopes evaporated, their minds full now of doubts. What are we to do? Is he not the Messiah? They don't yet understand the place or importance of his death. And in those dark moments, those, those, those dark circumstances surrounding the cross, it must have appeared to many that his promises would go unfulfilled. But God's word is settled in heaven forever. The promises of God in him are yes and amen. The promises of salvation are sure to those who will turn from their sin and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him. We'll soon see all of that come to a harmonizing, congealing understanding when the Lord is raised from the dead. Death is not the end. Death is not the end. Death is a doorway. Death is a beginning. In the grace and mercy of God, in infinite wisdom, God often chooses to strengthen our faith through circumstances that would most seem to weaken it. Does that make sense? He refines us through fire, removing our dross. And what we see in John chapter 19, verses 31 through 42, are powerful encouragements to faith. The fulfillment of Scripture is to reinforce our faith. What happens here at the cross now after the Lord bows his head and breathes his last are to encourage 
unbelievers to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. These events, these circumstances, these fulfillments of promises, fulfillments of scripture are to encourage believers to press on following after him, not to turn back, to persevere in the faith, to be emboldened in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's promises are true. God's word is true. These things are so. These things represent reality. When the world seeks to paint before you a false mirage, this is what is true. This is what God has said. These things will come to pass. They have come to pass. And all those things that the Lord has said will come to pass. These are God's promises. And they are fulfilled. These are God, this is God's word. And it is affirmed. It's affirmed in the life, the death, the person, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you think with me for a moment about that, there's much here for a believer to be encouraged by. For a believer to be emboldened by. We should serve the Lord Jesus Christ, selling out for him. Because he is the son of God and he has redeemed us from our sin. But as sure as those things are true, there's also a warning here. And the warning is, as much as those things are true, the promises of damnation, the promises of condemnation, the promise of God's coming judgment is also true. And be sure your sin will find you out. God has promised wrath for the unconverted. And all his testimonies are sure. John, understanding that reality, knowing that that reality has been affirmed at the cross, when God, holy, almighty God, poured out his undiluted wrath upon his own son, that is true. God's judgment is true. God's judgment is coming. God's wrath against sin will be poured out, and it will be poured out on those who have rebelled against him. That judgment is coming. All these things are true. This is reality. This is God's word, and God's word here is affirmed. John writes, understanding that reality, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that you may believe that he is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So as we come to John chapter 19 now, verses 31 to 42, we're going to divide this text under two headings. First, the testimony of Scripture in verses 31 to 37. The testimony of Scripture. Secondly, the testimony of his disciples in verses 38 through 42. Two headings, the testimony of Scripture and the testimony of his disciples. Let's take a look first at the testimony of Scripture beginning in verse 31. Where John records in verse 31, Therefore... Because it was the preparation day, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. The testimony of scripture. Now we're going to consider the testimony of scripture under three headings also. The testimony of the Old Testament, verses 31 to 34. The testimony of the New Testament, verses 35 to 37. And then the purpose that John gives for that testimony. So let's first together, as we walk through our text, let's consider the testimony now of the Old Testament. The testimony of the Old Testament, beginning in verse 31. John writes, therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. 
As we consider in verse 31 now, the testimony of the Old Testament, it's really important to understand our setting. Verse 31 says that it was the preparation day, the preparation day, right? Considering our setting, it's Passover week in Jerusalem. The preparation day, it's a common term referring to the day before the Sabbath on Saturday. The preparation day is referring to Friday of that week, the Friday before their regular Saturday Sabbath. This particular Sabbath, according to verse 31, was a high day. It was a high day. It was considered a high day because this particular Sabbath fell during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, during the Feast of Passover. This was the first month of the year for the Jews. It was the month of Nisan. And at a time during this month, three old covenant feast days all fall within a one week period of time on the Jewish calendar. Those three old covenant feast days were the feast of Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, and the feast of first fruits. Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. So in John chapter 19, verses 31 to 37, John, in this text, is making a reference to a a connection here between the circumstances surrounding the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and Passover in particular. He's making this connection. Now we know John's reason for making this connection is so that you and I would believe Right? And the believing we might have life in his name. So we want to examine that connection together. What's the connection, biblically, between the Lord Jesus Christ's death, these circumstances around the cross, and this Passover, which was extremely important in Jewish worship? Turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And what the Lord has done in redemptive history is under the old covenant set up worship for his people but in setting up worship for his people he's also establishing types and shadows that point forward to their ultimate fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ and there's this connection that the Lord establishes between the picture and its reality right the picture and its substance We see that beginning in Exodus chapter 12. And look in Exodus chapter 12 at verse 1. We're to see the Lord Jesus Christ in these things. That's the connection that John's trying to make, right? And seeing the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilling these things is to bolster the faith of believers and to motivate or compel faith in unbelievers. So examine with me, think with me as we work through Exodus chapter 12 what John would have us see in these circumstances. Verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to do. This is the month of Nisan, or the month of Aviv, that we see here in John chapter 19. Verse 3. The Lord spoke to Moses, right? And he tells him, verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Now, the Lord is establishing a Passover observance. Incidentally, here in verse 3, the tenth of the month, or the tenth of Nisan, is when the Lord Jesus Christ makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. All that took place on the tenth of Nisan. That's the day so to speak, where the Lord Jesus Christ presents himself to the people as the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. What's being done here on the 10th of the month, every man, verse 3, shall take for himself a lamb. He's going to take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for his household, verse 4. And if the household is too small for the lamb, Let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Now, what would happen traditionally during Passover? Small groups of people, households would gather together, maybe 10, maybe 12, maybe 15, would gather together and they would observe the Passover together, all partaking of the lamb that was slain and then prepared for a Passover meal. The Lord gives us in verse 5, Specific instructions with respect to that sacrifice and that meal. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. 
Now we can understand what that points forward to with Christ, right? Without blemish, a male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it, verse 6, until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And the words there, at twilight, literally mean between the times or between the evenings. So here in Exodus chapter 12, Leviticus chapter 23, Deuteronomy chapter 16, Numbers chapter 28, all dictate that the Passover begins on the 14th of Nisan. Once the temple is built, these sacrifices aren't made in houses any longer. These sacrifices are to take place at the temple where God's presence is thought to dwell. And the Jewish people now would gather together in the city, come to the temple with their sacrifice, and prior to the sunset on the 14th, where at sundown would begin the 15th, they would kill their sacrifices. Historians record that the sacrifices in the temple, being so numerous, would be collected, gathered together, beginning at about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So they would have time to kill all the sacrifices prior to sundown, which would begin the 15th. Their days began at sundown. So the transition or the time between the evenings, between the times, would take place at twilight or in the evening of the 14th. They would prepare the sacrifices, prepare the meal to be taken at the beginning of the 15th, the sundown. Does that make sense? Sundown. It was reported at one time by King Agrippa. King Agrippa, it's reported by Josephus, King Agrippa wanted to take account wanted to understand the number of sacrifices being made in the temple. And so they decided to, to count the kidneys, the pairs of kidneys that were taken out of the animal. This was something that was to be done according to commandment. And that year that King Agrippa counted, they counted 600,000 pairs of kidneys. And what would happen, these sacrifices, the throat of the animal would be spilt, or the, the throat of the animal would be slit, the blood would be spilt, collected into bowls, and then poured on the altar. 600,000 pairs of kidneys that year. Now for those Israelites in Egypt at the Exodus, Moses writes this in verse 7. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night. The night is the 15th of Nisan now. Roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. And all those things have significance to the Passover meal. Verse 9, do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire. Its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, verse 11, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. And so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So the Jews would slaughter the Passover lambs late in the day on the 14th of Nisan, and they would eat the Passover meal immediately after sundown, which was at the beginning of the 15th of Nisan. Now what did this all commemorate? Look at verse 12. What did this meal memorialize? The Lord says in verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So what was the Lord then delivering his people from? From judgment. From judgment. They were certainly undeserving, weren't they? God had intended to judge the Egyptians, but they would have been caught up in the judgment of God had it not been for God's gracious and merciful deliverance. Look at verse 13. Now the blood 
shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so this day, verse 14, shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Incidentally, as we consider these things, right? As you consider and you think and you meditate on the events of the Exodus... And on the significance of this Passover memorial, what was the means through which God actually delivered his people from his wrath or his judgment? Well, if you think about it, he saved them by his grace. They certainly didn't deserve it, right? Through the means of their faith in him for his deliverance. Do you see? They, he saved him, them by grace through faith. They trusted in God. In the grand scheme of things, they weren't trusting in the blood. Do you see? They were trusting in God. They were trusting in God's provision. They were trusting in God for his provision of an acceptable sacrifice. There was nothing magical about the blood. Right? The blood didn't magically turn into the actual blood of their deliverance. <laughs> They trusted God. They trusted God, and then they simply did what God told them to do, and they did that in faith, obeying him in faith, trusting him when they obeyed. He saved them by grace through faith. Now drop down to verse 21. Drop down to verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Considering what the Lord had done, considering the Lord's deliverance, the Lord's mercy toward them, Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. This is the Passover observance. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, then we see hyssop at the cross, right? You shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. And what was the result of that deliverance? The end of verse 27. So the people bowed their heads and they worshiped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. Look at verse 29. It came to pass that at midnight, the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on, the, on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Lord kept his promise. Lord kept his word. As surely... As the Lord delivered his people by his grace, through the means of their faith, through the means of an acceptable blood sacrifice, the Lord certainly visited his judgment on the Egyptians. He visited his wrath upon those for whom he said there will be wrath. So the Lord delivered his people from judgment. This is the Passover. Passover... Passover was meant to point back to God's powerful deliverance, to his gracious and his merciful deliverance from the people in Egypt. But Passover also meant to point forward to God's future and ultimate deliverance when the Messiah comes. Deliverance from what? Deliverance from judgment. Judgment. 
deliverance from his wrath, his just and holy wrath that has been set, set apart towards sin. His wrath against sinners. Passover is meant to point forward to God's future deliverance also. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So Passover, right? Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Both the actual events that precipitated the memorial and all that the memorials themselves are intended to signify, those events, those symbols, all point to and are all fulfilled in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The judgment of God is coming. Do you hear? The judgment of God is coming. As surely as the Lord Jesus Christ came in his first advent, right? To die for sinners is as surely as the Lord Jesus Christ will return to execute judgment on the ungodly. Passover points to these truths. A divine verdict has been rendered. And you are awaiting execution if you're not found in Christ. That verdict is guilty. You and I, guilty because of our sin. If you're outside of Christ, you are guilty. Praise God that God has made a provision for your sin, for my sin. The question that we all have to answer is, what are we going to do about our sin? You can do nothing apart from your sin, apart from the grace of God and the mercy of God in the person and work of his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The executioner, the executioner of God's divine wrath is coming back. He's coming back. Apart from repentant faith alone, in Christ alone, for his provision of an all-sufficient blood sacrifice. You have no hope, and you are without God in this world, and you will die. You will perish. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41, that the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness. He will gather out of his kingdom all those things that offend, all those things who practice lawlessness, and what will he do? He will cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The Lord also says there in Matthew 13 that it's then that the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover. Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. And God has declared judgment on the Egyptians. He is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Paul says that we who were once far off are brought near to God by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pictured in the blood that was shed and spread across, across that lintel and on those doorposts, Paul says that now we who were once far off are brought near to God by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says we weren't redeemed with corruptible things like gold and silver. We were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ who loved us, right, and gave himself for us. I'm been thinking recently about um, how plastic and fake and flaccid and blunted so-called Christianity has become. Just full of superficial niceties. You go to a nice short service and you sing some nice songs and you hug a so-called sister, a so-called brother, 
You don't want to offend anyone. And so all the, the rough edges, the sharp points are blunted off. The blood is taken away. So it's all just nice. It's all just superficial. We just need to love one another. Just need to pray for one another. That's not the Christianity of the Bible. There is the reality of judgment that is bearing down on this world like a freight train and you will be crushed under the weight of it if you're not found in him. If that shed blood, the bloody sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ is not washed over you, you are lost. If you are not plunged beneath that flood, you will perish. All the lambs, all the goats, all the blood pouring over the altar, flooding out of the Temple Mount, down into the Brook Kidron, flooding that ravine as the Lord steps over it to go to the garden on that fateful night. All that blood pointing to the judgment of God against sin. As the Lord hangs in agony upon the cross, the wrath of God poured out upon him. All that wrath, all that torment, all that anguish as the perfect sinless son of God takes the full sacrifice for his people in himself on his body on the tree in one time, three hours upon the cross. The wrath of God against sin. The sacrifice of Christ for sinners. This is a bloody Religion is a bloody faith. Why? Because of the soul-damning seriousness of our sin. It took that cost, that price for God to redeem his people. And we, we put on this plastic, cheap veneer whenever we belittle or demean those things in our worship. Whenever the church just, they come together in a nice building and they put on the air conditioning and they want to be comfortable. Ah, oh, just the, the fake superficiality of it all, right? Lord, let, don't let that be true of us. Praise God for a nice building. Praise God for the air conditioning. Praise God for our fellowship. Praise God for fellowship food. Praise God for all those niceties, all those things. But praise God for his sacrifice and worship him and serve him and obey him and preach that truth. Judgment is coming and he is our Passover. He's the only hope. You are, you, you are without hope, and without God in this world if you don't have Christ. If you won't bow the knee, if you won't put your faith and trust in him, you are lost and God's righteous justice will rain down on this wicked world. I just pray that you're not a part of it when it does. Turn from your sin. How does the Lord, right, as we consider this picture of Passover, right, and the plague of the death of the firstborn in Egypt. How does, how, does, how does God, in his word, make that connection, right? In his infinite wisdom and grace, how does he, how does he communicate this staggering, earthquake, earth-shattering, infinitely profound, glorious truth in John chapter 19? Well, look at Exodus 12 and drop down to verse 43. How is this communicated by John? How is this communicated by the Holy Spirit? Exodus 12, verse 43. The Lord said to Moses, said to Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is, brought, who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten, you shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. Turn with me to John 19. Verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, 
the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might take, be taken away. Then the soldiers came, broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. They did not break his legs. Why? Why? Is this just a coincidence? Verse 36, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. All this in fulfillment of Passover. The Passover. He, Christ, is our Passover and he was sacrificed for us. This is a quote of Psalm 34, verse 20. And is revealed by the Holy Spirit to be a reference to the fulfillment of the Passover by the Lord Jesus Christ. Not one of his bones will be broken. Old Testament type, New Testament anti-type. Fulfilled by its anti-type, the Lord Jesus Christ. Old Testament shadow now replaced in the Lord Jesus Christ by the reality The word of God is fulfilled. The identity of the son of God, the perfect sinless son of God, who is God, the word who became flesh. The son of God is validated. The sovereignty of God displayed, all communicated here in such simple but powerful and profound terms. Not one of his bones shall be broken. Now, in addition to this, there is is a, a glorious sense in which the Passover, having been positionally fulfilled in its entirety by the Lord Jesus Christ, is still awaiting a final practical aspect of its fulfillment. In other words, there's an already and there's a not yet to this Passover fulfillment. Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. I want you to see this. Lord Jesus Christ being so merciful to give us great encouragement to our faith. Listen, if you turn from your sin, if you trust Christ, you follow him, these things, these promises belong to you. They belong to you in him. Luke 22, and look at verse 14. Here the Lord institutes the Lord's Supper. When the hour had come, verse 14, he sat down the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. A lot of debate over the timing of these events. The supper that the Lord and his disciples have together in the upper room is a Passover meal. They're celebrating the Passover meal together. We'll talk about the timing of these things in a moment. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all attest to that fact. The Lord says, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, verse 16, I will no longer eat of it. Eat of what? The Passover. That's right. Until it, what? The Passover is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now think with me. There's a future aspect of the Passover that won't be fulfilled until the kingdom comes. Look at verse 17. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, take this, divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The Lord died, shed his blood to purchase the new covenant. So what does the Lord mean here? What aspect of the Passover is yet to be fulfilled now and won't ultimately be fulfilled until the kingdom of God comes? Well, think with me. The Passover lamb, Passover, the Passover lamb was slain to redeem God's people, to deliver God's people. Our Passover, Christ, the Messiah, who, he was the fulfillment of all those Old Testament pictures, 
right? The Lord Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all those things. He is our Passover. The Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect, spotless, blameless Son of God, the Lamb of God who came to the world to take, take away the sins of the world, He came to deliver His people. All of His people. All of those people who were His then, all of His people now, all of His people who remain to be saved. A people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, as many as our Lord God will call. The Passover Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to redeem all of his people. The Lord said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, that the gospel of the, what? Of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then what? The end will come. The end will come. We're in that process, if you will, now. <laughs> The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So the Passover isn't fully, isn't finally fulfilled until all of God's elect are redeemed and the kingdom is established. Isaiah 11 prophesies that God will set up a banner for the nations. Who is that banner? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He will set up a banner for the nations. He will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Who are the spiritual seed of Judah? All those who by faith trust in Christ, turn from their sin and trust him. It's then that the kingdom will be fully established. Jesus said, I'm not going to eat the Passover again until that day. Until that day. You eat it right? Remember me and my sacrifice by it, through it. Persevere in the faith, right? Maintain your hope. Be diligent in your mission. And the next time I eat of it, I'll be eating it with you in the kingdom. <laughs> Amen. So brothers and sisters, now is the time to preach the gospel. Now is the time to preach the gospel. That's what we are here to do. If you've never turned from your sin, turn from your sin and trust Christ. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you don't want to find yourself sitting on the outside, right? Back to John chapter 19. With respect to point one on your notes and the testimony of Scripture... In John chapter 19, verses 31 to 37, we're looking specifically now at the testimony of the Old Testament in verses 31 to 34. Now, one important aspect of that Old Testament testimony referenced by John here is the Lord's fulfillment of Passover. We've looked at John's reference to Passover in that not one of the Lord's bones were broken, but two... There's also a reference here to the fulfillment of Passover in the timing of these events. And all of this points to, of course, the sovereign control of God over all these circumstances, right? The Lord Jesus Christ now is dead and he's hanging upon the cross. And he still is in control over all of these circumstances. Now, the purpose, John chapter 19, of these Selfish, self-serving, murderous hypocrites in verse 31 is to get Jesus in the ground before sundown in order to obey Sabbath regulations, okay? The Romans otherwise would have just let them rot. That was their custom. Let them stay on the cross until their bodies literally rotted away. Let them be eaten by vultures, eaten by animals. But the Jews want them off of the cross because of Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. Deuteronomy 21, 23 stipulated that a man hung on a tree must be buried the same day. For he who is hanged, the Bible says, is accursed of God. He became accursed for us so that cursed sinners could go free. He hangs there. The Jews believe cursed of God. Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21, not necessarily in their minds envisioning crucifixion, but hanging, 
They apply to the crucifixion and they want to take them down before sundown in order to obey their Sabbath regulations. Now, (laughs) having murdered their Messiah, the Son of God, having lied, having given him up to a, a savage, brutal death, all because of their wicked envy, they seek to obey Deuteronomy 21, 23, right? The, 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 the continuing hypocrisy is sickening. It's absurd. So seeking to hasten the death of those crucified, they ask Pilate, for their legs to be broken. This was brutal. They would use a large, heavy iron mallet called a crucifragium, similar to a sledgehammer. And up against the the hard, upright beam of the cross, they would swing that mallet and literally crush the bones of their legs against the post. Now, apart from... The excruciating pain of that and the further blood loss, it made it impossible for them to push up with their legs to keep their chest cavity open so they could catch a breath. The remaining strength in their arms would soon give out and asphyxiation followed and they would die from asphyxiation. Verse 32 records this. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. Incidentally, after they did this, one of those hanging there closed his eyes in death and opened his eyes in hell. The other hanging there, right? Astounding grace and mercy. He's hanging on a cross. And in that excruciating pain, Having closed his eyes in this life, he opens his eyes in paradise. Let that sink in, right? Verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. And we know from verse 30 that he was already dead. Not because death took him. But because all things being accomplished, he said it is finished. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He laid down his life. Death didn't take him. He delivered up his own spirit to death. Now, consider with me the timing of these events and the timing of his death. We know that Passover from Exodus chapter 12 began on the 14th of Nisan when the Passover lambs would be killed late in the day to prepare for the Passover meal that would take place right after sundown. After sundown, it became the 15th of Nisan, which was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the day that the prescribed Passover offerings were made at the temple. You have those lambs killed for for the Passover meal, but then the Bible instituted sacrifices to be made on Passover in the temple. The 14th of Nisan during Passion Week, the week leading up to the Lord's crucifixion, fell on Thursday. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that Jesus sent Peter and John into Jerusalem, right, to find the man who was carrying a pitcher, to prepare the upper room for their last Passover meal together on that Thursday evening. As they were preparing for the meal, the Lord intending in his heart and mind to establish the Lord's Supper with them in the upper room, The Passover lambs by the thousands were being slaughtered in the temple in preparation for the meal. After the Lord observes the meal with his disciples in the upper room, Christians would no longer observe the Passover meal. The Lord institutes the Lord's Supper. And as often as we eat of it, we are to eat in remembrance of him. As the sun came up then... On Friday morning, it's the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the Passover would continue until that evening. So Passover running from essentially sundown on the 14th to sundown on the 15th, Friday. Jesus Christ was crucified on Passover on Friday. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 28. Numbers chapter 28. 
Numbers chapter 28. In Numbers 28, you have the sacrifices prescribed. The sacrificial system established. You see in Numbers 28, verses 1 through 8, you see daily morning and evening sacrifices commanded. They were to sacrifice both morning and evening. Oftentimes in the temple, according to Josephus, those sacrifices, the daily sacrifices, were offered in the morning beginning at 9 a.m. or the third hour. With the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice was set for 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And again, literally meaning at twilight, meaning between the times. So between evenings, so to speak. So morning and evening sacrifices, 9 a.m., 3 p.m. So Jesus Christ, as Jesus Christ is condemned by the Jews to die the first lamb of the regular daily sacrifice is being tied to the altar. Now, in addition to the daily sacrifices, there were specific sacrifices commanded for Passover. Look at Numbers 28 and drop down to verse 16. On the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. And on the 15th day of this month is the feast. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. You shall present an offering made by fire as a burnt offering to the Lord. Two young bulls, one ram, seven lambs in their first year. Be sure they are without blemish. Their grain offering shall be a fine flour mixed with oil. Three-tenths of an ephah you shall offer for a bull. Two-tenths for a ram. You shall offer one-tenth of an ephah for each of the seven lambs. Also, one goat as a sin offering to make atonement for you. You shall offer these besides the burnt offering of the morning, which is for a regular burnt offering. In this manner, you shall offer the food of the offering made by fire daily for seven days as a sweet aroma to the Lord. It shall be offered besides the regular burnt offering and its drink offering. And on the seventh day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. The Passover sacrifices took place between the regular morning and evening sacrifice. You had the daily sacrifices, morning and evening, lambs being slain. Passover sacrifices took place in the middle. Turn back with me to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 23. Again, Passover was on the 14th of Nisan, between the times, or at twilight as the Bible says, that literally translated between the times, overnight into the 15th. Look at Leviticus 23, drop down to verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight, or between the times, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Bread in haste, right? Bread uh, not able to be uh, leavened, so to speak. Not able to take time to rise. You need to eat it in haste. This is urgent. Get out. The judgment of God is coming, right? Eaten in haste. Verse 7, on the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. So in John chapter 19 then, verse 14, keep your finger there in Leviticus 23. John chapter 19, verse 14, John notes that the Lord Jesus Christ was before Pilate at the sixth hour. Now considering that John was likely referencing Roman time, what we're accustomed to, the sixth hour would have been 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Mark 15, verse 25 Then Mark, referencing Jewish time, records that Jesus was crucified at the third hour. That would have been 9 a.m. We know that to be true. Counting from sunrise at 6 a.m., that puts the crucifixion of Jesus at 9 a.m. The Lord Jesus Christ spent six hours on the cross, right? At the same time of the sacrifices, between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Do you see the connection? The first three hours, as it were, under the contemptible and mockering gaze of men. The last three under the wrath of Almighty God for our sin. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 11, our author to the letter to the Hebrews says, Every priest stands ministering daily 
offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. They're just temporary covering, right? Temporary, awaiting final fulfillment. But this man, Lord Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with him after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds this. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, where sins have been fully remitted, there is no longer an offering for sins. That sacrifice forever done away with because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ of himself for sinners. That's interesting. Back in Leviticus 23, it's interesting also, considering our text in John 19, that the feast of first fruits also fell during this time. You had the feast of Passover, had the feast of unleavened bread, and then the feast of first fruits. Look at Leviticus 23 and look at verse 9. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. What day was the Sabbath on? It's on Saturday. So what day was the day after the Sabbath? Sunday. Sunday is the Lord's day, right? Sunday is the Lord's day. You shall offer it on that day when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. And its drink offering shall be of wine, one fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout all your generations in all your dwellings. The Jews celebrated first fruits to acknowledge God in providing a harvest. Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Paul says, but now Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Christ is the firstfruits of a great harvest, right? As the seed falls into the ground and dies, so that that seed can then spring up and bear much fruit to the glory of God, even so the Son of Man must die, (laughs) First fruits of a great harvest of souls at the end of the age. Now, all combined, this was a, a powerful testimony to the Jews concerning the claims of Christ. Right? The Jews would have seen Christ as a cursed, hung on a tree. Why should we believe in a Messiah who's dead? But just as God delivered Old Testament Israel from their bondage in Egypt through the blood of the Lamb in the Exodus, he also provided deliverance for the the penalty of sin, ultimate deliverance from his wrath for his people through the substitutionary death of his only begotten son. John wants them, wants us to make this connection, to see Christ for who he is and what he's done. Back in John chapter 19, with respect to point one on your notes, The testimony of Scripture in John 19, 31 to 37, we're looking specifically at the testimony of the Old Testament. One important aspect of that Old Testament testimony referenced by John is the Lord's fulfillment of Passover. Jesus fulfilled the Passover in the circumstances of his death. Jesus fulfilled Passover in the timing of his death. The Feast of First Fruits looks forward to its fulfillment in Christ. Let's look at one more example pointing us to the testimony of the Old Testament. 
That's the prophecy of Zechariah referenced in verse 34. Look first at verse 33, John 19, verse 33. When they came to Jesus, saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Now, one thing I want you to note first, this is important, Jesus died. Jesus Christ died. This, this, this piercing of his side wasn't to check and see if he was already dead. The verse 33, these soldiers who knew what they were doing had already presumed him dead. They already had pronounced him dead. Jesus died. He hasn't swooned. He's not in a coma. In verse 33, they saw clearly that he was already dead. So this was, this was no more than a, a one final, gruesome, grotesque, abuse of the Lord's body. It could have been a, a, a despicable curiosity wanting to release the fluids that had collected in his chest cavity. However you look at it, Spurgeon called it the last kick of the old enemy. It's just another final grotesque abuse of the Lord's body. There's been much speculation over the water and the blood, whether the spear pierced his heart or the pericardium. What seems to make most sense to me is, is recent research that I read concerning hemorrhagic fluid, this fluid that collects in the chest cavity when there's been severe trauma to the torso or to the chest. As it collects, this hemorrhagic fluid separates. There's a clearer serum at the top, and the heavier deep red layer sinks to the bottom. And so with trauma, to the torso, trauma to the chest cavity, this internal bleeding, this internal fluid would collect, they say as much as two liters of it, so that when a chest cavity then would be pierced, would be opened here by a spear, both of those layers, essentially looking like blood and water, would flow out. The point is here that John is making, that he's dead. The Lord Jesus Christ has died. This signifies death beyond any doubt. His blood was shed. Incidentally, his blood being shed, the only way that sinful man can be right with a holy God, right? The idea that we would shun in our praise and worship the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that hymns would be changed to remove the blood is absurd. And John is once again faithful to point us again to the Old Testament in reference to this fact. Look at verse 37. Again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. This comes from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Turn there with me quickly. I want to wrap this up for us, considering these fulfillments of Old Testament scripture. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Where Zechariah says, I will pour on the house of David... And on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they've pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And notice first, the subject of the prophecy here is David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Pilate is certainly guilty, right? The soldiers bear responsibility. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 quotes this passage and John says that every eye will see him and will mourn because of him. However, here specifically, Zechariah assigns guilt for the crucifixion to the Jews. Now notice the progression. God pours out a spirit of grace, pours out a spirit of supplication. Then he says, they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn. It's true of anyone who comes to Christ. God must pour out the spirit of God upon them. Pour out a spirit of grace. Pour out a spirit of supplication. Then you will look upon him whom they've pierced and you will mourn. We're to think of this passage against the backdrop of Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. If you remain indifferent to these things, if you can sit here and listen to these accounts and be unmoved by the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to cry out for God to pour out on you the spirit of grace, a spirit of supplication. God, soften my wicked hard heart. Uh, turn my heart to you. Turn my mind to you. May I be moved by these things, by the sacrifice of Christ. May I look on him who's pierced. May I consider the filth of my own sin. And Lord, may I, for your glory and my own good, mourn for what I've done against you. Right? Pour out a spirit, God, of grace and supplication. Look on him whom they pierced and mourn for your sin. 
considering the Bible's clear teaching here on the, on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, notice that God says, they will look on me, a clear reference here to God, and they will mourn for him, a clear reference to Christ. John recalls this passage in Zechariah and applies it to the Lord Jesus Christ. All the Old Testament testimony points to Christ. Testimony of the New Testament is quickly summed up back in John chapter 19, verse 35. The testimony of the New Testament here, again, quickly summed up by John in verse 35. He who has seen has testified. John speaking of himself. His testimony is true. And he's telling the truth. John is giving an eyewitness account. Now records all this evidence in the New Testament gospel that bears his name. John would later write in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, the Lord Jesus Christ, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life, The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father, with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you so that your joy may be full, right? John says, listen, I saw these things. I handled him. I touched him. I hugged him. I was with the Lord. My eyes have seen. My ears have heard. And what I'm saying is true. Won't you believe on Christ? Believe on him. The testimony of the Old Testament points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the the testimony of the New Testament all points to the Lord Jesus Christ. And John communicates two reasons for giving us this testimony. That you may believe that the word of God might be fulfilled. Verse 35, he who has seen is testified. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. These things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says they shall look on him whom they pierced. John says, consider with me who he is. Consider with me what he has done. Consider with me the testimony of God about him. Consider The whole of God's word is about him. Consider how God, in all his redemptive plans, all his redemptive purposes, is working in him and through him to accomplish his ends. Consider how how all of the promises of God are yes and amen in him. And turn from your sins and put your faith and trust in Christ. He is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world, the only acceptable sacrifice, the only sufficient sacrifice is Jesus Christ, our Passover. I love this hymn. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's commands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul. I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. All blessing, honor, glory, power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Amen.